ticked, did the down and ticked, did the down and ticked, did the down, down. As you look, the whole room explodes, explodes. So my name is Slava, I'm from a company called Engineers, and I'm really proud to be <coughs> MC in the first conference. Uh, in the last year, I've been to 16 conferences, so I'm really proud that this is the one that I'm actually going to be MCing. Uh, just a couple words about myself. I've done a lot of DevOps, uh, sysadmin, done some web coding, uh, which I got coming in yesterday. Okay, this explains the beard. I don't know. So, um, we're going to start uh, with the first speaker. Um, he is the founder of HashiCorp. He is the creator of Vagrant, Packer, and Surf. And someone told me, he actually automated so many things that he got sued twice for that. So please welcome Mitchell Hashimoto. Okay, thank you. Is this good? The mic's good? Yeah, sounds like it. All right, um, let me see if this thing works. Yep. All right, so uh, I'm actually used to walking around a little bit, so this will be a little tricky, so I'll try to stick by the mic. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, how to build robust systems, uh, what defines a robust system, uh, and really uh, how ser uh, having a good answer to service discovery and configuration actually gets you uh, quite a bit of the way to a very uh, robust system, almost for free, uh, even for legacy applications. Um, so uh, I got a pretty good introduction. Uh, I did get sued twice for automating things, uh, but I'm still here. Uh, and. Uh, this slide really just has my Twitter handle. So if you have questions and you're maybe too shy to ask them uh, out loud or something, you could feel free to tweet at me or just catch me after, and I'm happy to answer anything you want. Uh, I started and worked for a company called HashiCorp, and we're really a DevOps tools company. Um, our basic idea is that uh, a company that isn't a DevOps company can't really build good DevOps tools because uh, it just doesn't align with their goals. You know, they'll build something to solve a problem, but they won't uh, take the time to solve it well because it just once they solve it, it fixes their business problems and they move on. Um, so we kind of try to work with companies to figure out how they're doing things and how we could help make things better, uh, and we try to make it work uh, in the general case for more people. So to that end, we've released four pieces of software so far. Uh, these four, uh, most everyone here I think is sort of vagrant, um, and then uh, there's there's these other ones. But actually today I'm going to be mostly talking about uh, console, uh, but the other URLs are up here in case you want to check them out, and I'm happy to answer questions about any of the tools as well. So we're going to be talking about console, uh, but I kind of want to talk uh, more generically first. So I want to start by taking a step back and seeing, uh, take a look at the big picture and get the, the reason why software like console and its category even exists and what the problems it's trying to solve uh, are. So not too long ago, actually, uh, a lot of web things looked a lot like this. You would have uh, a single node, uh, unless you're a fairly large company, and you would just have services on top of that node. And this view of the world uh, was really simple and easy. Uh, but it didn't last very long. So very quickly, uh, you'd have multiple servers, but really more generally, virtualization uh, took over, and suddenly things started looking like this. So then you started having hypervisors everywhere, uh, and then on top there you would have multiple uh, separate operating systems, and then on top of there you would have even more services, and you could imagine there's various problems here, but things are just getting a little more complicated everywhere. Uh, services you can no longer assume are on the same machine. You can no longer maybe even assume that they're on equal ports. You're just kind of trying to figure things out. Uh, and then a lot more recently, really uh, only in popularity in the last year or so, uh, things have started looking more like this. Uh, despite containerization technology existing for quite a while, uh, it's really taken off the past like year. Um, 
and now we have another layer on top of it. And, and while containers don't actually need a hypervisor, that's generally the way people run them, uh, at least right now. So we just have more layers, uh, more places things could be. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to find things. And, and actually the problem's uh, a little bit worse than this. So it, you never just have one hypervisor. So actually this is, even in the small case, in small companies, um, this is starting to be repeated uh, at least a dozen times, but you know, generally hundreds of times, and if you're a pretty large company, thousands of times. So you just have a ton of things, and really this is the state of modern ops, is we have more everything, and while the reason that we have more everything is because it solves certain problems, it's definitely made a lot of other problems uh, much worse, or exacerbated them, made them much more obvious. So uh, the way I see it is there's no future that exists without more servers, more hypervisors, more containers. I don't see anything getting smaller. And so we really need to take a look at these problems and figure out uh, what good answers are to them. And when I say pr problems in the context of this talk, what I'm talking about is the, the answers to these questions, which are really important. So you want to know things like, where is a certain service? Uh, is it on this machine or is it on another machine? How do I, where is it? Uh, you want to know if that service is, is healthy, so should you even be talking to it? Uh, should you just try anyway and determine if it's healthy by, based on the fact that whether you can talk to it or, or do you, does something else tell you it's unhealthy so you shouldn't talk to it? You gotta, you gotta know that sort of stuff. Um, you want to know its configuration. So when I say what is its configuration, you want to know things like what features does that service support? If you're, if you're in a big organization, you don't just go from version one to version two on 100 servers. You go from version one on 100 servers to version one and version two split between 10 to 90, then 20, 80, and stuff like that. And so you really need your application to be able to know, does this service actually support these new features that I'm trying to access? You don't know. Um, and then in a more of a service-oriented uh, or a pass way, uh, sometimes asking for the service's configuration is really asking, what are its access keys? What is the database's password that I'm trying to access? Um, in some infrastructures, that's a question. And then, and then finally, there's the question of, I see that there's a bunch of these foo services, but is there one I really should be talking to? Is there a leader? Is there a right node, a master, you know, whatever you want to call it, but is there one that I really should be talking to over the rest? Uh, and kind of posing a meta question is you also have to think, you know, what happens when the thing that answers these questions uh, is no longer available to answer these questions? Does your entire infrastructure explode? Does nothing, is nothing able to talk to each other anymore? How, does, how do things handle? And if you start thinking about this, it just, it seems easy at first, and then you think, and you think, and you think, and it actually just gets more and more complicated uh, and more and more confusing. Uh, and it's because they're pretty hard problems. So hopefully uh, I present some solutions today. But what I'm saying is uh, that these questions actually themselves, if you're able to answer them well, build fairly robust systems. Not completely robust, but it gets you quite a bit of the way there. So the practical goals, when I say robust system, what does that mean? Uh, the practical goals of what I call a robust system in this world where there's a ton of servers and containers and virtual machines is you really want to be able to start things in any order. It's, it's really dumb when you have to start a database before you start the web application because other, otherwise the web application just crashes. Like, it, can't the web application just wait for the database? I don't understand. So you really want to be able to start things in order because the goal you want is you, if you're starting a data center, you just want to be able to plug a bunch of machines in, tell them what they are in any order you want, and have them eventually work together. Um, you want to be able to destroy things with confidence. So as you have more things, uh, of course, perhaps obviously, more things are going to fail and more things need to go into maintenance more often. Uh, and in these cases, you really don't want to be afraid, really afraid of unplugging a server. You want to know that if you unplug it, uh, the r r rest of your infrastructure is going to handle it gracefully. Uh, you want to be able to restart servers safely. This is kind of combining the top two, um, but still equally important. It's just more of a fast thing. But if you want to do upgrades or something like that, you want to be able to confidently stop and start things pretty quickly. And, and again, no things aren't going to explode. Uh, and then finally, um, often not really highly valued until you get it, but you want to be able to reconfigure services easily. And when I mean reconfigure services, you want to be able to basically uh, turn knobs so that uh, you could quickly add feature flag features on, put things in the maintenance mode and stuff without 
having a heavy reconfiguration step across your infrastructure that might take uh, 30 minutes or an hour to roll out across all your nodes. You want something a lot faster. And so these questions, which I've already uh, explained, uh, I'm saying are actually, actually get you a lot of those goals or solves a lot of those goals. So we'll just go one by one very quickly. So where is service foo, of course, has three answers, actually one more, but uh, you know, service foo could be here, it could be local, it could be close in, in the same data center, or it might be external or some other external host, but you want to be able to handle every case. Um, but most of those are the same. More importantly, you also want to think about what if it's nowhere? What if that service doesn't exist? What happens if you bring up the web application and it asks for the database, and whatever's answering that says there is no database? What does the web application do? Uh, is a service healthy or available? So if the answer is yes, that's easy. Obviously, you use it. Um, the answer is no, it's a little trickier. So you have to think about, again, do you want to avoid unhealthy services? Do you want to try anyway and see if they work? Um, and you really want to be able to handle things gracefully. Uh, and when I say healthy or available, it doesn't just mean that it's on. Um, on. It's like if you have a bunch of services, it might be unhealthy if its load is too high. It, its load might still be high enough to answer your or low enough to answer your requests, but if it's too high, you don't want to keep pounding the same service. You want to ideally use another service as slightly lower load. So I would say that the high load service, although it's still functioning, is unhealthy and should be avoided. It's, it's sick, but not dying. Uh, and then finally, what is, or no, not finally, there's one more, but what is the services configuration? I think I cover this pretty well, but access information, features, uh, on or off switches. Uh, and then more importantly, I guess, what is my configuration? So uh, this is not something people think about too often, but uh, most people expect to just read configuration out of a static file, and for the lifetime of that process, for the rest of time, this configuration will never change. Uh, but that's really not uh, correct. The configuration has to change at some point, and restarting a service isn't too bad if your infrastructure can handle it, but not having to restart a service is even better. So. Uh, if you're able to ask a query something and ask what's your configuration and change that dynamically, that's even better. Uh, and then finally, where is, where is the best choice? And I talked about master-slave and maybe versions, uh, but there's also locality issues. So this really comes into play when you have a much larger infrastructure, um, but I think that in the next five years, everyone's going to have a much larger infrastructure. So what the locality problem is basically, I need to access a service, I would really prefer if that service was on the same machine, um, but if not, it's okay if it's on the same rack or prioritize the same rack next. And if it's not on the same rack, then let's prioritize the same data center. If it's not in the same data center, like if I must, I'll talk to another region. Um, but you really want something else to handle that for you. You just want to say, just give me a database and have it return the best case in terms of latency um, and availability and so on. And then the meta question uh, is, is this thing going to be available? And I would argue this is a very critical infrastructure component. So you want as many nines of availability as you can with this thing. But of course, you do need to think about what happens if it's not. So this builds a robust system. If you, could, if you have the means, a reliable means, to find services, know which ones are unhealthy and avoid them, uh, configure things externally, uh, and of course, trust that all this is going to be available, then your systems could really start and stop in any order and get all these properties that I mentioned here. Uh, I don't really need to go into detail about those. So we've been talking very generally. We've been talking about the general problem of more everything and the general uh, concept of a robust system and what we want in it. Um, but let's bring it back to something more concrete. Let's use real examples and start seeing how this actually looks in the real world and how we get uh, real solutions out of things. And for that, we're going to use a real piece of software that exists, uh, one that we wrote called Console. Um, but really quickly, before I talk about Console, just to, so I'm kind of fair, I want to talk about other options that existed or the way things, the way people tried to answer these questions before Console uh, and kind of their shortcomings or why we felt they weren't good enough and weren't fixable uh, in order to resort to writing a whole new system, a complicated system. So we'll go in order of probably uh, the worst idea to slightly better, um, and that actually usually coincides also with timelines. So this is the, the furthest back, and then we'll get a little more modern. But 
uh, kind of the furthest back in time, and hopefully not too many people are doing this anymore, uh, is the manual or hard-coded approach. And this is the idea that I'll just hard-code in DNS entries or IP addresses directly onto the server of where things could be accessed. Um, and it should be pretty obvious why this falls down really quickly. Um, but if not, you know, it doesn't scale. So as soon as you have thousands, not even thousands, as soon as you have dozens of servers, it gets, quickly becomes a real bottleneck uh, in your, your ops flow. It's not resilient to failures at all. So if that hard-coded DNS or IP resolves to things that are failing, uh, you can't really fix that very quickly. And the system, the only way the system actually knows that there's failures is it tries to connect or send a message to some address and it fails. There's no outside system that gives it more information about what the failure scenario is. Uh, there's localized visibility, audibility. So if you want to know what services are on what nodes, how many services are accessing version one of a service versus version two, you have very limited tools in order to figure that out. You either have to go to every server uh, and inspect its configuration or you have to basically look at like t raw TCP streams and figure out who's talking to what. Uh, either way, both answers are pretty uh, terrible. And then there's manual locality. It's really, again, more important for larger infrastructures, uh, but kind of obvious there. So then things got a little better. Uh, people started thinking, oh, well, this is a configuration problem. Where things go is a configuration problem, and I have this configuration management solution so I'll put the configuration into that thing. Um, and unfortunately, the configuration management isn't a really good choice for service discovery uh, or for service configuration in most cases. So the main problem is that uh, the most of the popular configuration management systems are really slow to react to changes. They're built to run on a cron job or on, on periodic intervals, and so even if you uh, add a new, I'm sure most of us here have like added a new service, uh, and we have DNS managed by Chef or Puppet or something, but we have to wait 10 minutes, half an hour, or sometimes longer in order for that service to appear because we have to wait for the cron job to kick off in order to run uh, Chef or Puppet. There's no like edge triggering of changes or very quick propagation of, of state changes. Uh, again, there's no resiliency to failures, so if you do use a uh, configuration management solution to, for example, find the IP of the database and populate the web applications with it, uh, if that database then fails, even if you bring up a new one in five minutes, uh, they're going to keep talking to the failed one unless you force the config management run on all the web servers. Uh, pretty related to the first one, but uh, a serious problem. Um, this thing isn't really configurable by developers, so even if there's knobs you want developers or non-ops people to be able to turn on applications such as feature flags or maintenance modes uh, or, or deploys sometimes, uh, I've never, I've rarely, I've not never, but rarely seen an organization where they allow developers to really change the configuration that, that powers the configuration management. It's, it's, there's usually a lot of process involved there. Uh, and again, locality, monitoring, all that, uh, manual. <clears throat> uh, so then, uh, this is kind of in response to the fact that with configuration management, you have the problem with like the database where if it dies, you gotta wait a long time before uh, you could update the IPs. People started thinking, well, I'll just put a load balancer in front of it because that's what load balancers do. They, they basically health check their backends and they uh, maintain long running HTTP or TCP uh, connections. So we'll just put Nginx or HAProxy or something in front of our services. Uh, and it does solve some problems. Um, it does solve the problem of, for example, very quickly failing over to a secondary backend. Um, but it's kind of interesting because you, you get rid of one single point of failure with uh, another single point of failure, um, which is now the load balancer. So now you have this available horizontal tier of services, uh, and usually you just have one load balancer, or you have a couple, but they're load balanced through DNS, or through, uh, uh, hopefully through like a virtual IP, a VIP or something. But either way, the load balancer is now a single point of failure, and it's really not necessary. It's there to to be a means to an end that's kind of caused by the config management problem. And you still have this question of how does that load balancer find the services? Uh, is that running configuration management in the back end? So when you add a new server, are you still waiting half an hour for the load balancer to even know about the new back end? Uh, that's still a problem. You kind of want things to be a little faster. Uh, and then kind of in the, in the same category, then people started using things like Zookeeper. Uh, Zookeeper was built for this sort of thing. 
Um, and it's a distributed key value type uh, configuration thing. And uh, the problem with Zookeeper primarily that we've found in infrastructures is it's very, very complicated. So uh, once you get it running, it actually works pretty well. Um, but you got to get it running, so that's a problem. Um, and the, the idea behind Zookeeper, their philosophical, technical idea is that Zookeeper itself is pretty dumb, it does very little, but the clients themselves are very smart. So if you want to do any leader election, or you want to do any locking, or you want to do any multi-data center, or you want to do any locality, uh, the clients themselves have to know this and manually do all the searches. The servers only store data and replicate data. Uh, and heavy clients are not friendly at all to legacy applications. It means that you have to change applications in order to understand uh, their service discovery semantics, uh, and I, we don't think that's really necessary. Uh, and Zookeeper on its own is pretty, uh, pretty much a building block. It, it gives you an ability to safely set keys and values and uh, lock keys and, and so on, but you have to build service discovery and service configuration really on top of that. You don't, you don't get anything for free. It's not really a full solution. So we built console, um, which we uh, tried to address a lot of these problems, and we tried to really build a modern system for service discovery that took into account things like multi-data center and having huge uh, scale and so on. So console uh, has four or five main features I'll just quickly cover. So the first one is a service discovery component, and this answers that question, where is some service foo? And we expose that two ways, through DNS and through an HTTP API. So uh, you could, for example, at the top, you could see I'm just looking up a DNS entry and it's giving me some IPs. Uh, and at the bottom, I'm, I'm doing a very basic git request and it's giving me a little bit more richer, more heavy information, but uh, there's more out there. Uh, the, the, the two are really useful because the DNS is super legacy friendly. Uh, almost every service going back to the beginning of of time for our purposes uh, supports DNS. So if you don't want to ever touch that server again, you could just reconfigure it to point to the proper DNS endpoint and that's all you need. Uh, but the HTTP is there because it returns a lot richer metadata and you could, you could think about things a little more detailed uh, versus just getting a blind list of IPs. Uh, there's failure detection built in and so this answers that question of is the service that I want to talk to healthy and available and uh, as an example, I show the, this UI here that we have for it, but you can see that, for example, the web service has a failing health check. And what's interesting about the failure detection and having it very coupled to the service discovery is that when something is unhealthy and critical, then the endpoints to discover services will no longer return that service. So DNS will no longer return that IP if, if any checks are failing. Uh, and HTTP, the discovery portion of the HTTP won't either. Uh, but the HTTP does have endpoints to get the full catalog, even the unhealthy things. But this is really nice because you get things for free, such as avoiding uh, nodes that are unhealthy for any reason. You just kind of get that for free. There's key value storage built in. So the key value storage answers the questions of uh, what is the configuration of myself or some service? And this is super simple too. It's, it's all HTTP based. You just put some data into a uh, into a, the, the thing and then you get it back out and we handle replication and so on in the background. Uh, I cover architecture a little bit later. And so the storage is highly available. Again, I'll, I'll cover architecture in a little bit. Um, but what's really nice is this lets you turn knobs without a huge config management process. So you can imagine that, yeah, you have Puppet or Chef laying down the main configuration, but for basic things like maintenance modes and feature flags, you use this process instead because this is a lot safer to allow developers to just go in and, and change values that are, that are, yeah, that are safe for, for them to change. They won't easily crash the system. Uh, well, yeah, I'll touch on it and I'll, I'll answer questions after. Um, and then finally, something that actually every other uh, service discovery and configuration system completely ignores from uh, from a feature standpoint is multi-data center, and we expose it as a top-level supported easy-to-use feature. So Zookeeper and other solutions basically say, if you want multi-data center, you run your own clusters and you handle the, and it's very in line with what Zookeeper thinks, but it's like the clients themselves handle which data center they want to talk to and trying one before the other and so on, whereas we really just bring it out top-level. So 
For example, uh, in this example, we're requesting certain services from specific data centers, um, asking for one from Singapore and one from Germany, and console itself handles where, how to, how to talk to that data center and finding the results for that data center. Um, more complicated, and, and an example I don't have, is you're able to use the HTTP API to ask for the web front end and give it a uh, priority list and say, I would like it in this rack, but then I would like it in this data center and then this data center. So you could, if you're in the east coast of the United States, you could say, I'd love, love to talk to the database in Virginia. If not, Oregon's okay. Uh, if not, London's not too bad. Um, and then, you know, it gets worse and worse. Uh, you get far higher latency as time goes on. But you could give it uh, priority lists and it'll handle it for you. Uh, multi data center also works with the key value. So you could actually ask for a key uh, at the end. There's a DC parameter, but you could actually ask for a key in a specific data center, and you could have different keys in different data centers. Uh, and not at the time of this talk, but very soon you could actually specify key spaces that uh, are replicated automatically across the data center. So you could have some that are global, and you could have some that are data spe center specific. And so the way we think of multi data center is it's local by default because that's usually what you want in terms of locality. You want something that's close. You want something that's, that's for this data center. Um, but it gives you the ability to query other data centers if you need to without having uh, to really hard code in the discovery of where the other data centers are uh, and how to forward requests to them and are they alive or can they even respond, you know, that sort of thing. It takes all that burden off the clients and puts it into our servers. Uh, and then just kind of a nice thing is we have a web UI, so people seem to like this sort of thing, but it is a really easy way to do, you know, in this case, here's a list of services, and when you click on a service like console, here's the list of nodes that are running that service, and then if you click nodes, you can do the reverse search, so those sorts of things are kind of nice, but, uh, you know, not, not critical, I would say. Yeah, you could... Nodes, service, uh, services, health checks, uh, KV management, all that for every data center all in a single UI. All right, so then uh, now let's quickly talk about the uh, operations of console. What make, what's, makes this nice from an operator's standpoint? Uh, and then the next section we'll talk about from a developer or user standpoint. But how does console answer that meta question of is this thing available and how do I know it's not going to just lose my data and things like that? It's the meta question, and you're not expected to read this, but we're, this is the architecture diagram that's online, uh, and we're going to kind of break this down over the next few slides. Uh, the next few slides are going to be kind of text heavy, but that's because I want to upload the slides later for reference, uh, but I'm just going to explain everything um, myself. So the first thing, uh, we're going to cover this top thing. So uh, the way this, let me just quickly explain the way this kind of diagram breaks down. Uh, the top square is one data center, the bottom square is another data center. The middle cloud is the internet or, you know, a wide area network of some sort. Uh, and then within there, the, uh, I don't know why they're different colors, but the blue should be servers, so the bottom row is servers. So in this case, the green box is surrounding the server cluster, because that's what I'm going to discuss here. So console runs in a client server architecture, and it's a uh, distributed system, not decentralized. Uh, you have these central servers. Um, but it, it is a distributed system. So for the server cluster, you run some odd number because they perform a leader election uh, in order to, to determine who does writes. Um, but other than that, they replicate all data to each other. So whenever you do a write, they don't let the write succeed until every server uh, has written it. And that's how you get uh, data safety, pretty much. And that's why you need this n over 2 plus 1 for availability, for leader election. Um, but the leader election is all automatic. You could write to any server because all the servers will automatically forward a request to the leader if they're not the leader. Um, it's very easy to use, and you don't have very many servers. Then you have lightweight clients. So uh, the clients actually don't store any persistent data. They just have ephemeral state and some cache data. Uh, they're very, very cheap to run. Um, and they're also optional, but highly recommended because uh, they perform, they make sure that the node they're running on is still alive. And if the node dies, then, then uh, the servers find out very quickly if you have a client. So the clients, though, are able to respond to any requests. So you could actually send any writes or any reads also to any clients, and they'll automatically forward it to the proper leader. So that's really nice because if you're running a client, uh, the DNS server is always localhost, the HTTP server is always localhost. Um, you don't need to solve the, the problem of, but how do I find 
the thing that finds things for me? Like, that's, that's a weird question to ask. So um, they actually find it for you. And the way they solve that problem is kind of interesting. Uh, they use a gossip protocol underneath. Um, so all the, all the nodes that this, this uh, console cluster is on have to be able to communicate to each other through a network. Um, and they use an extremely lightweight gossip protocol uh, underneath in order to automatically discover each other. And that's our surf project, if you want to look into surf. Um, I don't want to cover it in too much detail, but if you don't know what a gossip protocol is, a very quick description is, or analogy I like to make is it's a lot like uh, what would happen to society if there was a zombie apocalypse. Uh, if there was a bunch of zombies just roaming Tel Aviv right now, um, we would find out probably, assuming we don't have internet, uh, but internet actually works okay, but we'd probably find out because someone would run into the hotel and tell us, and then we would get freaked out, and we'd probably want to tell our families that are here, so we would call our families, and it just kind of spreads like it gossips out, and that's the exact same way this works. Is um, In a gossip protocol, you have one server join. It has to know about just one other, but it just tells the one other, hey, I'm a server and I exist, and then that server tells three, and then they tell three, uh, and then extremely quickly that propagates out. So uh, even in, we have some data centers that are running uh, a single console server of over like 10,000 servers in one data center, uh, and this health, this membership state information is able to propagate in less than a second, um, which is pretty cool uh, compared to something like config management where you gotta wait 30 minutes or an hour. Uh, less than a second, it's gonna work. Oh, I didn't realize I had a slide on this, but yeah, the cheap gossip. Um, one thing I guess I didn't cover is that it's super cheap. So even in that 10,000 node cluster case, the uh, constant state bandwidth that's using in your data center is, uh, is uh, it's like 700 kilobits per second, 736 kilobits per second or something. So you don't even see it on your network, uh, networking graphs, uh, really cheap, really nice. And we use it in two places. So we use it between one data center to determine membership and then console automatically sets it up over a wide area network as well in order to automatically discover the other uh, data centers as well. So you just gotta tell it the IP address of one node in another data center um, and it'll automatically discover all the servers in the other data center for you. Uh, and then finally there's multi-DC and the way this works uh, is it does not actually replicate storage to the other data center because that is full of all sorts of problems when there's a disaster scenario. Instead, what console does not uh, is automatically figure out what data center you're trying to talk to and does request forwarding. Uh, it also does parallel request forwarding if you're trying to request data from multiple uh, data centers, but it does that for you, which is, which is simple in the operations case because you don't have to worry about uh, data consistency across data centers. You only have to worry about it in one, uh, and it's easy from a client perspective because we handle all the forwarding for you. So general points, these are really text heavy, but you need some odd number of servers. Uh, the more servers you add increases write latency because it has to write to, you know, if you have five servers and you write one key, it has to write to all five before it succeeds. But we do do those in parallel, so uh, throughput is only marginally affected, but uh, the latency will be a lot higher. Um, and the nice thing about servers is you could, you could leave and add them at will. So if you want to do maintenance on a server, you don't even need to think if it's a leader or not a leader. You just unplug the machine and do maintenance on it and the system recovers. Uh, and then on the client side, again, text heavy slide, mostly for reference, but uh, clients could really easy, cheaply be removed and added at will, so you never have to worry about unplugging a machine. Uh, you just do it. Uh, the, the membership propagation using that gossip protocol, the, the whole cluster will find out that machine's unplugged in less than a second. It'll update health states and in milliseconds after that, service discovery will stop returning that node. That all, that all happens in, um, in much less than a second, actually. Throughput, it's, it's not very important, but throughput's uh, extremely fast. So we have some really big users of the console, and on spinning disk uh, hardware, they're clocking in reads and writes at both around uh, five or 6,000 per second uh, writes and 20,000 plus per second reads. And practically, you'll never hit that limit because if you're writing that many write requests to a service discovery solution, you're, there's probably a bigger architectural problem there. Um, but it's good to know that it could handle that sort of scale. Uh, it actually works a lot better on solid states too. It is an I.O. bound system. So all of that kind of heavy tech stuff was really to say that this uh, console is a very scalable and highly available system. It's actually really hard and you have to try really hard in order to make the data unavailable and, or you have to have an extreme disaster scenario 
where most likely most of your data center is unavailable anyway. Okay, so now from the developer perspective, perspective the user perspective, how do we tie this all together in order to use something like console with the applications that uh, already exist? So in this scenario, the way it kind of works is you use console KV for configuration, uh, the DNS for service discovery and coupling services together, uh, and health checks for monitoring. So the KV, uh, using the web example, uh, you're able to set and get keys just from the web UI, so you could just put things in there. And then on the cons consuming side, uh, you could, we're using a tool called mconsole that we ship here. Uh, what mconsole does, which is pretty cool, is it reads the keys from my app config in console and then exposes, as, exposes them as environmental variables to the app. So uh, this lets you basically pull in configuration from console without any source code changes to legacy applications uh, if they use environmental variables, which a lot do. Uh, and if you're not using environmental variables, it's easy enough to also turn them into config files. Uh, and then that reload flag, kind of cool, is it Whenever you change something in the KV, like if I hit update here, uh, that actually propagates the change. It does an edge triggered, you know, sub second, usually like five millisecond or less <laughs> uh, notification, uh, which actually restarts your application for you. So that lets you turn knobs and lets it go across your data center very quickly. That's, yep. Um, then for DNS, uh, for service discovery, you use the console DNS. Uh, mostly DNS versus HTTP because it's, again, legacy friendly and you don't need any source code uh, changes or awareness that console exists. You just assume that the service you find, you, could, you search for is available via DNS and you use the console addresses for them. Uh, again, no application changes, but uh, it also, this also handles health checks for you. Uh, the DNS round robins and randomizes the return order so you get some level of load balancing just through the DNS. Uh, and if there's too much load on one server, if you have a health check, again, n new nodes won't connect to that thing. And then for monitoring, uh, you basically, I bolded it, but the bold's kind of weak. Uh, but you basically just use Unix scripts. So exit status one is unhealthy and exit status zero is healthy. Um, and you just tell console how often you want to run the check. So uh, an, uh, one that everyone uses pretty much for web services is just run curl. If it returns a 200, then it, it's looking pretty good. So you can just run curl, tell it to run every five seconds, uh, and that's as easy as health checks get, and you can have multiple of these. And you could actually see in the UI um, the status of the health check. You could also see the output of the health check the last time the status changed. We don't propagate the, the, the status on every, uh, the output on every run because it's a lot of bandwidth, but uh, periodically we just update this or whenever the state changes. So you're actually able to use this as a pretty decent monitoring system, especially if you hook it into things like Nagios. Now, they're simple shell scripts. Like I said, they're very Unix-y. You get logged output, so when something does fail, like the load check is failing, you could actually see what the load is and you could actually address that. Um, and because, like, like I said, the health checks are tied into every other system, uh, you automatically get the property that if health checks fail, services don't show up. And I mean, this was a really simple description, but using this, you actually get quite a bit out of it. So using this, you could uh, add or remove services pretty easily. You expect that uh, they'll use DNS to find things. And if they're not retrying, then you could retry restarts of the application. Uh, you could see global state of all services and nodes from a single UI. You could set all the configuration in any data center from a single UI. Uh, the, the configuration changes is, changes that you're applying are edge triggered and will propagate across your data center uh, at sub-second speeds. Uh, you can implement rolling restarts there. You probably want to, but it's very fast to, to make these things happen and we're able to get pretty far without actually modifying any application uh, code. That's pretty cool. And that's kind of all I have to say. So uh, I have QA, I guess, after this. So I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, you have a couple of questions. Uh, right. A couple of minutes to answer questions. Um, so, so I can see how the DNS uh, solution would uh, would assist discovery of uh, you know stateless services, but what about uh, legacy apps that talk to a legacy database and scenarios like that? Uh, do you see console helping in those scenarios as well? Uh, 
So what about legacy application, legacy yeah, I, So if, if I have a legacy application pointed, pointing to an Oracle database and I don't want to hard configure that, I wanted to look it up and, 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 and then I wanted to look it up through the DNS. Oh, yeah. And then, and then have some failover conditions or, or whatever. Oh, my, my sense is that the DNS stuff would be helpful for stateless, you know, HTTP stuff, but, you know, for database, TCP, it might be more difficult. Oh, no, it's, or am it's, I wrong? Yeah, it's still super, so the question, oh, he has a mic. Um, but it's, yeah, it's still super useful for uh, databases, everything. Uh, for legacy things, actually, one of the features I didn't talk about that is really nice is you don't, for example, if you have an Oracle server, you might not want to install a console on the Oracle server. So you could actually register external services uh, with external health checks. And this is really made for uh, situations like that or situations like you're using a software as a service for something. Uh, but you could register them externally and still get their output via the DNS interface. So if we see a lot of infrastructures that um, use, for example, uh, yeah, third-party database hosts uh, like Redis Labs is here and stuff like that. Like you'll use some third-party software as a service, but you don't want a hard code uh, third-party thing in your configuration because you might run it, might run it yourself one day. So you just use the console DNS and it still returns the proper thing. Um, if you don't want to, if, if I mean, if you already have a hard-coded IP for your database and it's never changing, and you have a legacy application that's using that IP and you're confident it'll never change, then you don't you don't need to put that into the console system. Uh, you might just do it for sysadmin purposes in order to find it that way, but uh, there's no, you don't need to buy in all the way to get all the benefits. Got it, thanks. Can I ask a second question? Yeah. Uh, you, you talked about uh, configuration generation. You, you, there are two options, right? Injecting environment parameters um, on configuration change, but you also mentioned the option to actually generate config files on the fly. Can you yep. talk a bit to that point? Uh, so there's another tool called confd, uh, and it's kind of like mconsole, but it watches your config and then uses templates to regenerate configs and sends sig hups or sig term and restart, or, you know, it does whatever needs to happen to restart the application. Yeah, so the kind of the way I see that working in most infrastructures is uh, you actually have Puppet or Chef lay down the configuration templates and the initial configuration and service configuration, uh, like the init scripts and so on, but then you actually have confd or these m console or other tools that are taking the templates that it laid down that are ops approved putting in the value plugging in values that are much easily turnable and then restarting services great thanks i, yeah. I have third no i'm joking <laughs> okay any other questions okay this thing seems to be working so i i have a whole bunch of them but i'll limit myself to just the two important ones uh first off a quick question is this a, a commercial pro uh, like commercial product or open oh. source or no I would, I would never pitch a commercial product to you up here <laughs> uh no it's totally open source there's no paid component at all cool um okay so th the crucial question really is around the request routing because you mentioned that uh, among the things that need to happen for like a modern architecture, modern service is uh, handling request routing, locality, uh, you know, failure handling, etc. And uh, maybe it's because you focused on, on more the legacy aspects on, on like how to handle legacy systems, but mm -hmm. um, you know, modern day systems, the ones based on say Hystrix or Finagle, whatever, uh, also do a lot of uh, Client side, shall we say, load balancing, failure handling, etc. So, how is this handled, uh, you know, with this uh, architecture? Okay, so the load balancing scenario right now is just handled through the DNS round robining of APIs. Um, from a client side perspective, uh, one of the, uh, I suppose, one real, uh, a concrete example is we get is if you're hitting an HTTP API, uh, one, you don't want to make a DNS request every time. Uh, and two, you don't you want to avoid the situation where everyone chooses the same IP and just stampedes um, on a service. So the the answer really is either to use the fact that we uh, randomize the orders and and assume that that won't result in a stampede. It usually doesn't. Or you could actually still use things like HA proxy or nginx in front of uh, your services if you want more complicated load balancing. Uh, strategies and so on, but console actually makes it a lot easier, even in that scenario, even though uh, I mentioned it was kind of, it had its negative aspects, console can actually mitigate those because uh, you use console as the way that it quickly finds its backends and you could actually run multiple, so it's not a single point of failure and use console as a way to then get multiple IPs to that thing. Does that answer your question or is? 
Uh, I believe so. I just want to just want to verify uh, that I understand correctly. So basically, whenever I ask Consul, you know, where is my foo service, I get back a quest. I, I get back an answer that's good for that particular request. Yeah. Every so we we serve DNS with a zero TTL. So okay. every as long as you have a DNS client that's well behaved, which sometimes is actually asking for a lot. Um, then you'll get a different response every time. And we actually, on the server, it's not truly random. We say random for documentation reasons, but uh, it's actually not truly random. We actually round robin them for each request. So if you have 10 servers do 10 DNS requests, they'll, they'll, get, rotated, uh, they'll get rotated responses. OK, thank Good. you. Thanks, guys. We're running out of time. So uh, if you have any questions to Mitchell, feel free to grab him if you want to talk about yep. the console or Vagrant. You can grab him during the breaks or if you want to know how to avoid not getting sued, feel free to grab him. <laughs> so we're going to have uh, breaks, you. we're going to have an after party, so feel free to grab him. I give him a round of applause again.